I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm very, very happy that Romania is a host for such kind of conferences. As some of you remember, in 2013, here in Bucharest, um, it was organized by the Romanian Humanist Association, together with, with IAGU and uh, European Humanist Federation, the general assemblies of these humanist international uh, NGOs. Um, and it's important to have more and more conferences, more and more meetings between humanists all over Europe and all over the world here in Bucharest in Romania. Um, as some of you or maybe all of you know, there are many, there are many um, Okay. Okay. I'll try to. There are some limits that I didn't know. Um, so it's important to have such such kind of meetings here in, in Romania because, as most of you, maybe all of you know, uh, there are a lot, a lot of humanist issues here in this country. If you speak about religious education in schools, if you speak about religion in politics, if you speak about financing churches with public funds illegally, from my point of view, if you speak about a lot, a lot of other humanist issues, you will find them on the agenda in Romania. Um, My speech is entitled From Humanist Activism to Humanist Politics. Um, you may think, you may suppose that there is a kind of difference between doing humanist activism and humanist politics. Having the, the, the experience of both of them, let me confess you that my view is that there's no big difference. And I will try to show you why. Um, and yes, there is sunshine outside. It's very warm these days in, in Bucharest. So um, that's why I decided to wear this day a t-shirt with a tiger. But please don't be scared. <laughs> He's not religious. <laughs> Um, if I try to wear this t-shirt in the parliament, because I am a member of the Romanian parliament, I may be in trouble. And there were some debates in the parliament. If I may wear this kind of t-shirt in the plenary, or if I have to wear a tie and a kind of clothes which are more serious. Uh, from my point of view, I may wear such kind of t-shirt and your kind of t-shirts. Because in the first instance is, is a matter of freedom. It's a matter of how you want to live. And sometimes how kind of messages you want to transmit to others. Um, so maybe, maybe this is an example of a slight differences, of a slight difference between social activism or humanist activism and politics. Politics is more restrictive on some appearances, but in the essence of 
your work, as I'll try to show you, there's no big difference between um, social and humanist activism and um, humanist politics. You may say the same things, you may do almost the same things, um, but, and this will be my conclusion, doing humanist politics is more effective. Your influence over a society, your impact over a society, it's much, much bigger. Um, I told you a few words about Romania and how many humanist issues uh, we may face here. Uh, there's a long tradition of very strong connections between the main church, the Orthodox Church, and political powers during history. Uh, almost always, the main church was very strong related, very strong connected with the power, the political power. And I may show you a picture from the 40s. You may see here a patriarch of the Orthodox Church during a kind of fascist meeting. Um, despite the um, tragic histories during communism, there were a lot of priests uh, who took part to the political power during communism. And you may see here one of them speaking in the great plenary of the communist parliament in the 50s. And speaking about what's happening in Romania in the recent years, you may see here a famous picture having in the middle of it the former president of Romania. Mr. Trambasescu, who was very, uh, who was a very strong supporter of of the church and a very strong enemy to the Romanian democracy, from my point of view. But the story doesn't end. A few months ago, we had elections in Romania, and there is a new president who is not Orthodox, who is Lutheran and who is not Romanian, who is German. Uh, he's, a, he's a member of the German minority. And he was elected after a campaign in which the orthodox candidate, because, because in the finals there were two candidates, one of them orthodox, one of them Lutheran, the orthodox candidate used uh, the orthodox church for his campaign. But the people said no. The people uh, said that they want a new democracy with more tolerance, with more diversity. And it was a very, very good step forward for our country, for Romania, um, to a better and more European democracy. But uh, even if there is no procedure to allow this, uh, unfortunately, um, in the parliament, uh, the Social Democrats succeeded to invite the patriarch of the Orthodox Church to speak and to bless the new president. What, what happened is outside procedures. I tried to oppose. Some of my colleagues supported me, but in, and there were uh, uh, discussions about it, this even a few minutes before the ceremony. This uh, happened in uh, November last year. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, uh, after a lot of debates, 
the patriarch gave uh, his blessing to the president. And this blessing is not something only symbolically, because if it would be just symbolically, it would be maybe not, uh, not a real problem. But unfortunately, in Romania are spending a lot, they are spending a lot of, of public funds for building new churches, for, um, uh, and these new churches are not three or four or five or I don't know. There are thousands, many, many thousands of churches which are built and in the same time, as you may heard, uh, speaking with Romanian humanists, in the same time, there are a lot of schools, a lot of hospitals, which are closed. Uh, and the government always pretend that we have no money to support these hospitals, so we have to close it. We have no money to support these schools, we have to close them. Um, so there are consequences. There are huge consequences of having such a strong connection between politics and religion, mainly the, um, uh, the Orthodox Church. Uh, but Christina said that I'm one of the pioneers of humanists. Um, there were um, the, the first NGO, which uh, was founded in Romania, was founded in 2003, together with Mr. Emil Moise, who will speak after me, is here. Together with Gabriel Andreescu, uh, who is one of the first humanist voices in Romania. He wrote a lot of articles in the 90s, and he inspired me to join this movement. Um, unfortunately, he is not here, but he is also an author and a strong supporter of humanist values. And we had other colleagues. One of our first campaigns was Safe Carol Park campaign. You may see here a picture. There were thousands of people in a park, one of the most beautiful parks in Bucharest, um, where the church and the government wa wanted to, uh, to build the biggest Orthodox church in Eastern Europe, the Cathedral for National Redemption. Um, um, fortunately, this time, we succeeded to stop them organizing seven protests and uh, starting a lawsuit against government. We won in the court and we stopped that project and we saved the park. That campaign was half environmental and half secular humanist because uh, of course we promoted the separation between church and state and our reasons were secular humanists but in the same time, it was also an environmental issue because a lot of people came to defend their, their park, came to the protests. Um, as, as a member of civil society, I took part to a lot of protests. Here is one in front of the parliament for promoting education, education culture and science no, and saying no to religious indoctrination. Um, but what I, what I tried to do, together with a lot of other humanists in Romania, I still can do in politics, and I still participate to some protests, so there is no big difference. This is a, a picture from a, a protest last year in a place called Punjesti, where government uh, wanted to start uh, uh, fracking exploitation of shell gas. And me, together with many others, we, we tried to oppose it to this project. And we somehow succeed. There's also a, pro, um, a march for LGBT people. 
uh, I'm here together with Ulrike Lunacek, who is a member of the European Parliament and who is a, a co-chair of LGBT intergroup in the European Parliament. She came to Bucharest. She came to support LGBT rights. Um, unfortunately, no other Romanian politician uh, decided to be to be there. Unfortunately, because of this this huge pressure from the religious um, side side of uh, of the Romanian society to politicians, even those who think well, and even those who uh, those politicians who. Um, who have good values, they don't have enough courage to speak openly uh, for the media and in public uh, about uh, some controversial issues like LGBT rights. Um, anyway, there are also some good news regarding politics and let me tell you a bit, a bit about them. Um, despite the fact that the church is so powerful in Romania. Despite the fact that um, any government, no matter if it's liberal or social democrat or conservative, um, any government gave a lot of public funds to churches. Uh, let me tell you that in the last two or three years, there were some changes, and I will give you some examples. Um, in 2013, I proposed a law for recognizing civil partnership. In most of the European countries, there are already such kind of uh, laws voted. Um, in Romania, it was a huge scandal, and after this scandal, uh, the vote in the Senate was maybe three or four votes in favor of the pro, uh, project, 105 against, and in deputy chamber there were only four votes in favor and almost 300 against. Uh, but uh, there is a procedure that allows you to put back a project uh, in the parliament for a debate after it uh, is rejected. So it, is, it was rejected in 2014. I put it back on the agenda. And there were two, two very good um, steps forward. In Senate, any project is debated, and in Deputy Chamber too, it's debated uh, first in the commissions. There are some commissions for human rights, for uh, family, for uh, working uh, issues, and so on. Uh, so, the Commission of the Senate for Equality of Chances voted in favor of this proposal for the first time, about one month and a half ago. Uh, of course, the project was rejected by the Senate, but this time, we got almost 20% of the votes in favor or abstains regarding this project, which is much bigger than uh, at the previous vote in 2013. Uh, in the same time, in the deputy chamber, this week, it was a historical vote again at the commission, the commission for uh, working issues, and social security, it was also a vote in favor. And the media exploded. There were many articles, many debates, and it was in the news for two or three days. Um, uh, it was, this information was in the news. So there are some changes. And this, um, and one, um, and another, think which is very important is that these changes uh, and these debates in the parliament um, somehow make a lot of people just to think about. For many decades we just don't had 
a debate regarding su such, such kind of issues. Uh, but uh, now there are debates. People are talking about it. Some people, when I walk on the streets, some people come to me and say congratulations. Some people uh, try somehow to say, oh, you are gay, shame on you. Anyway, they know about this issue and they think about it and they have an opinion. This is a very important step forward in order to change a society. It's not enough to vote for a law. The main change is in the mind of the people. And what, what I, I tried to do in civil society for many years, together with my colleagues and with a lot of very good people, um, I may do now in politics on a larger scale because what I'm saying now as a politician and I was elected in 2012 what I'm saying now as a politician is the same thing what I said as um, a member of civil society but right now uh, the media is more interested. That's why I told you that I think that doing humanist politics is more effective. Uh, at least having in mind this um, reason, the media is more interested. If the media is more interested, there are more and more articles. Having more articles about some issues there are more and more people who think about those issues. Um, and you have more chances to influence the mind of the people. Influencing the mind of the people, you have a chance for a growing pressure from the society to change somehow the public policies, not to give too much money to churches, not to indoctrinate children in schools, um, um, recognizing uh, civil partnership and there are many other issues. Let me give you another, another um, good news. I propose the law because, because in Romania it's not allowed for a non-believer like you to be a president or to be a prime minister or to be a member of the government because of the oath even if you are elected by the people as a president in Romania, you will become a real president after you will say the oath. And this oath is mandatory. And the, the final words of, of it are, so help me God. So if you are not a believer, you have a problem. What you will do? You will say these words lying about your conscience or you will not say these words refusing to become president or a prime minister or a member of the government, minister of, or secretary of state. And I propose the law to change this oath. For us as members of the parliament, there is an option. You can say this oath on your conscience and honor. But as I told you, for the members of the government and for the president, there is no option. And this is written in the constitution. So you cannot change the constitution with the law. The constitution has, is heavier than an ordinary law. But I propose the law which is in conflict with the Constitution, and somehow it is unconstitutional, saying that, look, there is something much important than the Romanian Constitution, and this is the European Convention of Human Rights. And the freedom of conscience is written there, and if there are some international treaties which are signed by Romania, uh, these international treaties are much, are more important than the Romanian Constitution. So my proposal, my initiative, my draft law 
is based on Com European Convention of Human Rights. But they replied to me, it is, con it is unconstitutional. <laughs> anyway, it's a long story. I do not have too much time to, to, to speak too much about this. I will conclude. Um, according to the procedures, the first chamber, the Senate in this case, had 45 days in order to take a decision. If the Senate uh, does not take a decision in these 45 days, it is considered that that proposal was approved. And these 45 days passed. So this week, um, this law was voted, was adopted by the Senate uh, according to the, this procedure. Anyway, and, and as I told you before, this week also uh, was uh, that historical vote in the Commission for Working Issues and Social Security. And if you ask me, how did you do this? How did you convince your colleagues to vote for civil partnership, for instance, knowing that the church is so strong and the public opinion, maybe it's not too much in favor. And I will um, tell you the secret, how I succeeded to convince them. I just told them that if they will not vote for civil partnership, they will burn in hell forever. <laughs> because God is love, and this law regarding civil partnership is about love. So if they oppose to love, they will oppose to the God's will. Um, I took the Bible with me, believe me, <laughs> and I quoted Corinthians. Corinthians, there are some passages, very nice passages regarding love. Uh, of course, a priest who was present told that it's a blasphemy that a non-believer quote the Bible, quote the Bible. But uh, yeah, after these debates, uh, and there were many other debates in, uh, in the parliament. Um, my colleagues voted for the God's will. So, my final words is do what, do your best in civil society. Do your best in order to defend the humanist principles, the humanist values. We need to build secular societies. We need to um, face some prejudices, some hate speech, um, and a lot of offensive um, uh, speeches uh, from the people who defend a kind of conservative religious issues. But sometimes uh, you may find allies between Christians. You may find allies uh, between other um, members of some other religions. And this is the case in Romania. Sometimes uh, some people who are religions, but who are also secular, um, who have secular views and who defend the separation between church and state may be your allies. But if somehow, someday, you will have the chance to do this step to politics, do so. Of course, maybe a lot of people may think, look, but in politics there are a lot of bad things, it's tricky, it's dangerous, it is dangerous, it may be tricky. 
But if you have strong values and if you will keep going to, uh, to promote your work, no matter what, no matter other, what others uh, are saying, uh, you will do something very good for your society and um, the change will come. Maybe not so fast as you want, but as I told you, sometimes God can help us. Thank you very much. So, if if there are if there are some questions, I I will um, respond to them. Yeah, maybe this works. have strong humanist NGOs. It is very important. It is a very important layer in any society to have strong humanist NGOs. And it, it is very good that in Romania we have stronger and stronger humanist NGOs. There is Romanian Humanist Association, there is Romanian Secular Humanist associ Associations, there is Solidarity for Freedom of Conscience, and there are other um, groups and movements which are growing. So it's very important to have a strong civil society. In the same time, it is very, very important also to have some humanist political voices in the parliament and maybe someday in the governments. Because if there is only a strong civil society, strong human humanist civil society, without no representatives in the uh, political at the political level it will be very hard to influence the final decisions of the parliament having some humanist voices in the parliaments or in the governments there is a better chance um, uh, to have good humanist decisions in order to keep the religion and, and state separate in order not in order not to use public funds for building new churches and so on. Um, so from my point of view, it's important to have strong civil humanist society, uh, to have some humanist voices in the parliament, and to f do something in order to have a good cooperation between them. But without humanist voices in politics, it will be harder. What do you think? <laughs> the good news is that there is, that there are some voices. So that there is a voice. The bad, the bad news is that there, there is only one. Um, speaking about the, the oath, I was the first Romanian MP who took the oath on conscience and honor, not with the religious formula. So help me, God. You are state, right? Constitution is quite ambiguous. The Constitution is quite ambiguous from my point of view. In Constitution, it's written that the re religious cults, religious den denominations, are autonomous regarding state, but there is no word regarding separation between church and state or um, something like this. So, so you're not <sighs> look, uh, a problem with the laws in Romania 
is that in many cases they are not quite clear. It's not quite clear. For instance, the region, there is also a law regarding religious freedom. And the, the Article 9 of this law says that there is no um, state church. And the state is neutral regarding religious um, uh, cults. But in the same time, at the next articles, you will find that the state support the church so much that you may consider that de, de facto, in fact, you have a state church because it receives a lot of money. The patriarch can, only the orthodox patriarch can uh, bless the president as he is the king. Uh, so there are a lot of privileges given to churches. Uh, and when you ask what does this mean to have a separation between church and state, it's very hard to say in Romania, look, because of the separation between church and state, this is happening. And let me confess you that I, I see almost no sign that there is a separation between church and state, even if it's written somehow in, a, in an, an ambiguous law. to get into politics in uh, a party as you did the Green Party or any different party that already exists or to found a humanist party because in, for example uh, in Italy nobody, uh, no politician would openly say that they do not believe in God or that they are humanists uh, because they don't want uh, uh, non-believers to be identified with one party or the other and so now, right now, uh, just two years ago, uh, there was a non-believer party founded. But I don't know, I think that could be even worse for identifying a particular group uh, of society. So what are your thoughts on that? Any solution is good. But it's important to have humanist voices at the political level. There are some humanists who consider themselves to be liberals so they may join to some liberal parties. Other humanists consider themselves to be social democrats. So let them join to the social democratic parties. Others are greens or maybe some conservatives. <laughs> um, but uh, it's important to have people from many parties speaking on this democratic language of secular humanism. Because first, I, I think that first of all, we as secular humanists, we are democrats. But some of us may be liberals, greens, social democrats, or whenever. Um, but it's important to do, at least some of them, to do politics and to speak for separation between church and state. If there, if there is no other question, let me say that uh, I'll be very... Uh, is yeah. it possible to hold a referendum? To lose it with 95% to 5. <laughs> Do you actually believe that 95% of them they are practicing religion? No, no, no. Uh, anyway, it was a joke. But um, uh, it depends which is the question. If the question will be, do you want to recognize civil partnership, maybe we will get 25% about in favor. If you will ask, do you agree to give public funds for the huge, giant uh, Orthodox Cathedral of National Redemption, maybe uh, the referendum will be in favor of us because many religious people are very against using public <coughs> funds for building such a huge cathedral. So it depends by, by the question. Uh, a higher body authority, if, uh, if a state uh, signs a treaty with the European Union that will abide uh, by the civil uh, human rights 
for example, uh, who can you tell, uh, how can I report if the government is not abiding by the grid? If it breaks it and it doesn't follow the rules. For example, uh, when we try to report the, the foul play about the secular state, they say that it was, for, for example, a law that is passed, it, it is not secular and does not abide by the grid. And we say that's not uh, constitutional. But every response we get is it was made by the government, and the government uh, works uh, through the constitution, apropos it's constitutional. Who, who can we report such a behavior? Um, there are some procedures. You may go to the court. Uh, regarding discrimination, there is an authority called the National Council for Combating Discriminating. Um, you may ask the parliament to change some laws. You may ask the governments to stop some abuses. You may go to court. There are some possibilities. And the next speaker here, Mr. Emil Moise, uh, I suppose that he will speak about a huge success um, at the Constitutional Court, which happened last year, and he was the, the, the man who started the lawsuit. All of the details he will speak about. Uh, but um, anyway, you have to be aware that somehow you may face this. And this is not a military parade, but is... Um, this may show that in Romania there is a huge force of the main church. And if you will come here for a longer time, you will find that they really have a force, financial force, symbolically force, political force, and so on. So. Even, even if you are right, if, even if the law is on your side, it won't be easy to change anything in this environment. That's why uh, what Emil Moise did, it's a huge, huge success. Thank you very much.